This presentation is part of an educational program that's sponsored by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and it's intended to educate building management as well as building staff about bed bugs and their control. And the idea here is that you can then take this presentation along with the other educational materials and the information that you learned today and use it to educate your peers as well as to educate residents within the community. So as you probably are aware, bed bugs were once very common here in the United States up until about just after World War II when they were virtually eradicated from the U.S. through widespread use of chemicals like DDT and malathion. And not only do we not have chemicals like DDT or malathion today, but you can see that they applied them in ways that we would never even consider today. Back then they didn't think so much about safety and exposure, so beds were literally hosed down with DDT. And one of my favorites is this mom who's releasing a DDT bomb over the top of her baby's crib. So obviously things that we would never even dream of doing today. But because of these activities and because of the effectiveness of DDT and some of the other chemicals, bed bugs were essentially eradicated and we've been without them for nearly four decades. That is up until about 1999 when bed bugs started becoming more prevalent in the US again and at that time it was mostly limited to the hospitality industry, mostly hotels and motels. And most people would think, oh, well, we're talking about like the little dive hotels, but that's not where it was happening. It was happening in the, the middle and the upper class hotels. It was largely associated with business, executive travel, and leisure travel. Well, it didn't take very long before bed bugs spread into the residential sector, and the multifamily housing industry was especially hard hit. But bed bugs are also very prevalent in university housing, and they're even found in middle and upper class homes in residential neighborhoods. So recognizing that bed bugs had become much more prevalent in our society, New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development began tracking the number of reported calls into their agency. And as you can see that when they started tracking this back in 2004, there were only 537 reported calls. But in 2010, there were nearly 13,000. This is a rapid increase. It's exponential in nature. Rarely do you see things increase at this kind of a rate. But it's not just cities like New York. It's not just big cities for that matter. Bed bugs are found in all size cities, are found in small rural towns and communities in all 50 states throughout the country. So this has become a national problem. And because bed bugs are such good hitchhikers, they've moved from the residential settings, these infested homes, and into our communities. And so when you look at a list like this, um, Perhaps the better question is not where do we find bed bugs, but where don't we? Because bed bugs are being found virtually everywhere. So that raises the obvious question, you know, how does this happen? How did we go from having virtually no bed bugs to being in a situation like we are today? And the answer is that, that nobody really knows for certain exactly what caused the resurgence of bed bugs, but it's believed that there are a, a series or a number of factors that combined are responsible for bed bugs once again getting a foothold in the US. And we can start with the fact that we no longer have some of the very effective pesticides that worked in the past, like DDT, and then they eventually became resistant to DDT, and then chemicals in the organophosphate class took over, like malathion and durazban and other organophosphates. But these, ex these materials don't exist today. And the materials that do exist today aren't very effective. In fact, Bed bugs have demonstrated very high levels of resistance to many of our modern day pesticides and in many cases these materials work poorly or not at all. Add to this that we've changed the way we do pest control. In the past it was common to go through entire apartment buildings spraying every apartment on a routine calendar basis for things like roaches and ants. But today we use things like cockroach baits which simply are not effective against bed bugs. So with all these various pesticide pressures released from the bed bug or removed from the bed bug. When people travel to other parts of the world where bed bugs were more prevalent and introduced bed bugs back into, uh, into their environment, without the pesticide pressure, the door was open for bed bugs to successfully establish populations. And once bed bugs do become established, then they begin to spread very rapidly throughout our communities. And there's a different set of factors that allow this to occur. We can start with the fact that 
While most people are very aware of bed bugs, there's still a general lack of awareness or knowledge about them. So most people don't necessarily know how to recognize them, how to avoid them, and what to do if they get them. And because they're not familiar enough with bed bugs, infestations aren't detected quickly enough. And this allows infestations to become very well entrenched and it promotes further spread. In addition, they're extremely difficult and very costly to control. And so for both of these reasons, in many cases, bed bug infestations are reduced to low levels, but not necessarily eradicated. And if they're not eradicated, that sets the stage for population rebound and additional spread. And finally, when we're talking about multifamily housing communities, very often bed bugs are dealt on a reactionary basis, meaning that they're treated one at a time as we become aware of them, rather than taking a community-wide approach that's proactive in nature that identifies the infestations as quickly as possible. Well, because bed bugs have become such a huge problem in multifamily housing, the Department of Housing and Urban Development released a set of guidelines that was just updated very recently and this includes best practices for bed bug management as well as outlines the rights and responsibilities of both management and the residents. So this is something you need to be familiar with and regardless of whether or not your community has a problem with bed bugs, it's absolutely critical that everyone become educated about bed bugs so that in the event we're dealing with bed bugs you can make the proper decisions for cost-effective, safe, and efficient management of bed bugs. So we're gonna start off with a few basic facts. And what you're looking at here is the very first stage of a bed bug that is completely engorged with a fresh blood meal. So these are very tiny little insects. Uh, their integument is, or their skin is clear, so you can see the crimson blood through their skin. The first thing is that bed bugs feed exclusively on blood and nothing but blood. Uh, they require it for development as it matures from one stage to the next, and they require it for reproduction when they reach adulthood. So this is different than other blood feeding insects. If you think about something like a mosquito, only the adults are feeding on blood. The immatures are aquatic and they're living in the water feeding organic, on organic matter. So you only have a small percentage of the population that's actually blood feeding, but with bed bugs, 100% of the bugs are consuming blood, and that makes them different than your average blood feeder. They don't feed every day though. They typically feed about once every week or so. And this is a biological hurdle for us when it comes to control. Because what you have to realize is that a bed bug spends about 90% of its life hiding and only about 10% of its life active out in the environment. So when we're doing control, the day that you're there doing a treatment, only a very tiny percentage of the bed bugs are really going to encounter those materials. And many of the bugs might not encounter those materials for several days to a week or more. And at that time, the materials aren't working as well, if at all. This is a challenge for control. They're also very resilient. They can survive many months without a blood meal. Uh, bed bugs can easily go three, four months maybe upwards of six months or more without feeding. And so for this reason, you can't really starve them out. A lot of people make the big mistake of vacating an apartment with bed bugs, and this is one of the worst things you can do because once an apartment is vacated, it's very difficult to deal with that population because they're just gonna go dormant. The other thing is that they're very prolific. The female, when she reaches adulthood and she's mated, she's going to deposit about one to three eggs per day. And where she deposits these eggs makes them very difficult to find, as you'll see in a little bit. Um, now these eggs are then, once they're deposited, are going to require seven to ten days until hatching. This is another obstacle for control because not only are the bugs hard to find, but they're also very difficult to destroy and there's not a whole lot of methods that are very effective. So on the day of treatment, any, bug, any eggs that are missed are going to continue hatching over the next seven to ten days, again setting the stage for population rebound and further spread. And finally, they're nocturnal, and they're very, very cryptic and secretive. And this makes it very difficult to find them as well as to treat. Okay, so we saw in that last slide what the immature bed bug looked like when it was fully engorged. Okay, but bed bugs take on a variety of, of sizes and colors depending on their developmental stage and whether they're fed or not. So we can start off with the egg, which is right here. All the stages of the bed bug are visible by the naked eye. So these are not invisible insects, but the egg is quite small. This is only about a millimeter, about the size of a pinhead. Okay, from the egg, 
we're going to get the first stage immature, which you can see is, is also about a millimeter. And for comparison's sake, if you look down on the bottom left here, here's a penny. And if you look at the letters in God We Trust, the first stage bed bug is about the size of one of the letters of, on a penny. So if you want to get an idea of just how small they are, you can use that as a comparison. Now they're going to get slightly larger and slightly darker with each developmental stage. So they're going to they're shed their skin, go to the next stage, shed their skin, go to the next stage, getting a little bigger, a little darker each stage. They'll go through all the instars and then they're going to reach adulthood where they're about a quarter inch in length and they're like a mahogany brown or a reddish brown in color and quite large. And then when they're engorged, you'll see they can become very, very swollen. You saw the, the red swollen bug in the first slide. Now you're seeing what an adult engorged bug looks like in this slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, they feed exclusively on blood. And this blood feeding typically occurs at night while you're fast asleep. The bite is usually painless, so the person has no idea that they've been bitten. And once the bug is fully engorged, it'll scurry off and hide back in its secretive hiding place. Now, while it's true most bugs are feeding at night, Hungry bugs will feed at any time of the day or night, depending upon when the food's available. So if somebody's working a night shift all the time and they're only home during the day, they'll switch their feeding patterns to the daytime. Or if there's excessive competition from other bugs in very severe infestations, they'll feed when they can get a blood meal. It takes them about three to 10 minutes to become fully engorged with blood. Okay, and during that time, they may actually switch their feeding sites on the same person uh, multiple times. And every time they probe a new spot, the person may develop a symptom in that location. So you can't equate the number of bite symptoms or welts to the number of bed bugs that actually were feeding on you at the time. Um, lastly, the blood it comes in as crimson red from our body, but it's digested and it's excreted in a different form. It comes out as a liquid droplet, but it's dark brown to tar black in color. And this is a, a, a point of confusion, because a lot of people, when you tell them to look for blood stains, they're looking for red blood stains. But that's not what you're really looking for. The only way you're going to get a red blood stain is if somebody were to squash one of those freshly engorged bugs while it's still at a blood meal, similar to squashing a mosquito on your arm while it's feeding on you. So you're probably not looking for that. What you're looking for are what we call spotting. And spotting is this dark, tar-like or reddish brown to black staining that you'll get wherever they deposit the fecal material. This is a video. Uh, it's time lapse. Remember, it takes about three to 10 minutes for a bug to engorge. And you're going to see this first instar nymph uh, that's feeding on this volunteer here. And you can see the pumping action in the head. It's kind of pulsating as it's drawing the blood up uh, from the, the, the vein or the capillary. And then you can see that this bug is going to swell till it's just about ready to burst. And then it's going to withdraw its mouth parts and it's going to scurry back to its hiding place where you're not likely to find it. So because bed bugs feed on blood, obviously there's concern about disease transmission. Okay. Fortunately, bed bugs have never been demonstrated to be able to transmit disease through their blood feeding activity. So they're not considered a pest of uh, major medical importance from a disease transmission perspective. However, because they are feeding on blood, they can cause bite symptoms in many people, which can range from mild to severe. And they can also have a significant emotional impact on people that are dealing with bed bugs. So even though they're not vectors of disease, they are still considered pests of public health importance. Now, if people are reacting, the reactions to the bites vary quite a bit. Some people have delayed reactions. In fact, most people have delayed reactions until they become sensitized to the bites. So people may not develop symptoms from the bite for several days to a week or more. And then there's other individuals who never react at all. They develop no symptoms. And this is especially common among the elderly. So we see senior communities getting uh, very severe infestations because they're having a hard time seeing the bugs and they're not developing symptoms. So these infestations become quite large before they're detected. Now, when people do react, they offer a, a wide range of symptoms as well, from itching to severe itching, uh, welts, swelling, sometimes really um, nasty pustules on the skin. And then because of all the scratching, these can sometimes develop into scars. 
There's also, as I mentioned, um, an emotional impact. A lot of people will report having loss of sleep, suffering nightmares, or suffering from stress and anxiety associated with the bed bugs and also all that goes into eradicating them. Now, how do these bugs get around? We know, obviously, that they're very, very good at getting from one place to the next. So how do they do that? Well, they do it in one of two ways. There's both passive dispersal and there's active dispersal. So passive dispersal is when bed bugs are transported from an infested dwelling to another location, typically on personal belongings. So for example, uh, bed bugs could be taken from an infested home into school or into work on, say, the children's backpacks or the parents' computer bag, um, or potentially on your clothing, although that's much less common. Uh, they can also be transported during social visits or, or caretaker visits. So there's different ways that they can move around passively. There's also active dispersal. Active dispersal is when the bed bug is physically crawling from one location to another. And active dispersal will occur when bed bugs crawl through wall ceiling or other voids and utility chases that are associated with adjoining and neighboring apartments. They can also walk right underneath the door down the hallway and into another apartment. So the more bed bugs there are in the dwelling, the, the worse the infestation, the greater the likelihood that you're going to have this kind of active dispersal. So in many cases, when we get a report of bed bugs, and we have somebody calling from this apartment about a bed bug infestation, that infestation, in many cases, is actually originating from a neighboring apartment that has a very severe infestation that they have not reported. And the extent of some of these severe infestations that go unreported can sometimes be mind-boggling. Like this apartment, where you can see it, it's absolutely disgusting. Bed bugs everywhere, blood everywhere. And you have to wonder, how can somebody live like this and not say anything to management? But believe me, it happens a lot more often than you might think. Or how about this apartment, where the bed bugs were caked a couple inches thick on the bottom of the box spring? and the blood spatter on the pillow from the people that were squashing bed bugs as they were feeding on their faces. And so you say, how do these things happen? How does something like this occur? Well, it occurs typically for one of a few reasons. First of all, one reason is that people are engaging in some type of activity that they shouldn't be engaging in, and they're trying to avoid attention. Either they have people living there that aren't supposed to be there, or they're doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. So they're not going to report the problem. In other cases, people have some type of handicap where they're not capable of recognizing and reporting the problem. I would say this is one of the most common reasons in senior facilities. And finally, there are some people that are simply ashamed or embarrassed, and they don't want anyone to know about the problem until it gets so bad that they can't take it anymore. And this is something we want to try and educate people. There's no reason to be ashamed, and you really need to report these problems quickly. Because regardless of what reason uh, is responsible for this, you can see that when you have infestations like that, it leads to very um, significant problems, both economically and in terms of spread. So early detection is the key. We need to find infestations as early as possible because when we locate them early, they tend to be quite small, they can be remedied easily and relatively inexpensively. So how do we go about identifying infestations? Well, there's typically four methods, one, of one or a combination of these four that are used. The first is interview, visual inspection, monitors, and we'll talk a, a bit about canine scent detection. Okay, so interviews. This is interviewing the actual resident. And there's some real advantages here because you can get a lot of information about the background of the history of the, the problem. Like perhaps how long has it existed? Do they have any idea how they might have brought the problem in? How it got introduced? Uh, it's also a great opportunity to educate residents on the things that they can do to help in the eradication effort, what their role is, and just as importantly, what things they shouldn't be doing. The disadvantages are they're highly unreliable. People aren't always honest. People aren't always forthcoming. They might be embarrassed. They might be ashamed. They may not even know they have a problem. So the information that you get is not completely reliable. So I would recommend doing interviews, but not as a standalone. You need to back it with other methods as well, like visual inspection. Visual inspection is probably the most common method for identifying bed bug infestations. However, you have to realize that visual inspections are very labor intensive and they require somebody with a great degree of skill in knowing how and where to look. Um, typically, a, a good visual inspection could take anywhere from a half an hour 
to an hour or more, depending on the complexity of the environment. You need a real good flashlight. It's a good idea to have a magnifying glass. And you want to make, you want to make sure that you don't lull yourself into the belief that just because you can't find bed bugs that they're not there. Remember, this is a cryptic secretive insect that specializes in not being found. So when you have low level populations, it's real easy to potentially miss an infestation that exists. Okay, now where are we looking? Well, obviously bed bugs are feeding on people primarily at night while they're asleep. So we're, we're paying attention to sleeping and resting areas, mostly the bed and the upholstered furniture. Most people think that when they're looking at a bed, that the bed bugs are gonna be found on the seams and the tufts of the mattress. But quite honestly, if you're finding bed bugs easily in these types of areas, this is probably an indication that this is a more well-established problem that they've been here for quite a while. Because bed bugs, again, are secretive cryptic insects and they're gonna hide in areas where you're not gonna find them, in areas of least disruption first. So at the beginning of an infestation, it's very likely that all these typical areas are gonna be free of bed bugs. And you may not find them until you get down to the box spring. And you're typically gonna to have to remove the mattress and remove the box spring. You may not find them until you get to the underside of the box spring. And then in some cases, you may not find them until you remove this dust cover, and that's where you'll find the bed bugs, okay? Because they're trying to stay in a place where they're not gonna be identified. So we can see all the various signs here. We can see the spotting, we can see eggs, we can see bugs and shed skins, and so this is the area where they're gonna start off in many cases. Here's a video of a severe apartment. So if you go in and you're doing an inspection and you can just walk up to a bed and find bed bugs that easily, then you know that this is a problem that's been there for quite a long time. And this is gonna be very difficult to eliminate potentially and is likely to have spread to other units as well. They don't limit themselves to just the beds and upholstered furniture. They'll also infest contents of the structure. And the closer the, these contents or personal items are to the bed or to the sofa, the more likely they are to be infested. So these are shoes that were very close to a bed that became infested. This is uh, furniture that was next to the bed. And again, you can see the, the live bugs, all the spotting, some shed skins. We can see the eggs, okay? So very, very typical for the bugs to move off the sleeping and resting areas to nearby items. The other thing here is the wheelchairs and motorized chairs. You know, if you think about it, people are spending a lot of time doing what? They're, they're sitting, they're at rest. And so they're a very susceptible blood meal. So it's very common for bed bugs to infest wheelchairs and motorized chairs when we're dealing with the elderly or the disabled. And these are things that should absolutely be inspected. Along the same lines, you, you know, you have to start to think outside the box a little bit and you want to try and understand the behaviors of the individuals. So where are they spending most of the time during the day or the evening? Is there certain furniture that they sit in more than others? And by learning their behaviors and understanding their behaviors, this will help guide the inspection as well as control efforts. So here's a, an example. Um, you know, you got to wonder, why, why is he showing me a bathroom? Okay, well, this is an apartment of an elderly woman who was severely disabled. And she spent a lot of time in the bathroom. Well, we had treated this apartment numerous times and the apartment still had bed bugs. It wasn't until we understood that there was a significant amount of time spent in the bathroom. And so you can imagine if she's sitting in the bathroom for extended periods of time, then she's, you know, again, someone that's sitting there waiting to be fed upon, it's a good place for bed bugs to harbor. So what we found was, you can see on the back of the hinges, behind the toilet here, this is all clusters of bed bugs and fecal material and cast skins. So they're not always where you might expect them to be. And as these infestations get more and more severe in nature, the predictability of bed bugs is going to become less and less. So they can be found in virtually anything, like inside the bindings of books, on stuffed animals. This was a population found inside the head of an adjustable wrench. So you can imagine how difficult they can be to find. Okay, now another method of uh, detection is using monitors. This is a monitor that's known as an interceptor. And these types of devices are very, very effective at identifying bed bugs. So these devices are placed underneath the legs of beds, 
or upholstered furniture. If you can't get them underneath the legs of the beds or furniture, you can put them immediately adjacent to the furniture and they'll still work quite well. And what they do is as the bugs are traveling in search of a blood meal, uh, they'll climb up into this device and get trapped in the well here and um, now they're exposed for identification. So this is an inexpensive tool that is highly effective in detecting infestations. Canine scent detection is another method of inspection. It's become increasingly popular in the pest management industry as an inspection method. They offset the limitations of a visual inspection because the dog isn't relying on what it can see, it's relying on what it can smell. It uses its olfactory senses to detect the odor of bed bugs. Because of this, these inspections can be much more efficient. A dog can typically get through an apartment in just a few minutes, whereas a person could take a half an hour to an hour. They're also much less invasive. We have to tear the beds apart, turn everything over. A dog can pick up the odor of a bed bug right through the dust cover without disassembling the bed. And they're especially well suited for large scale inspections of entire communities because it would take weeks to get through a community of 300 apartments but a dog could probably do it in a day or two. Canine scent detection has its limitations as well, just as does any method. Um, dogs are relying on their ability to smell the odor of bed bugs, and sometimes odors can become trapped depending on where the bed bugs are. Uh, there's also a problem with false alerts. A false alert is when a dog is indicating that bed bugs are present when in fact they are not and this can lead to other problems. So what I would suggest is if you do have canine scent detection as a tool that you're using, you wanna make sure that you have a verification system in place. In other words, if a dog alerts in a particular unit that bed bugs are present, don't take that as an absolute. Now you need to confirm whether you can verify bed bugs. Can you find them through visual inspection? If you can't find them through visual inspection, then perhaps continuing to keep a close eye on that unit and do additional monitoring would be in order. But you don't necessarily want to go through and do a full bed bug treatment if you can't confirm that there's a problem. Okay, now regardless of what method you're using for inspection, it's a good idea to have collection vials and some tweezers. We've provided that in the kits that we've given you. The idea here is if you see anything that looks like it might be a bed bug and you're not 100% sure, you want to save a sample because there are a lot of insects. They may not look like bed bugs here on the screen, but when they're only one millimeter in size, they can really resemble a bed bug. So you want to save samples so that they can be looked at by somebody who's qualified and confirm whether in fact it is or isn't a bed bug. Okay, so how do we control bed bugs if we are dealing with a problem? There's a lot of different methods, and I'm not going to go through them all on this slide, but we will go through a bunch of them in the, in the slides to come. But the point is that there's a lot of different methods, both physical methods, non-chemical and chemical. Many of these methods can be used very effectively by staff. Some of them can be used by residents, and some are best left to professionals. But a, a sustainable bed bug program is going to require a combination of tools. It's not just going to be pesticides alone or one item alone. It's going to require a combination of different methods. But let's start first with preventing bed bugs. There's no absolute way to truly prevent bed bugs, but there are ways that you can minimize the likelihood that they're introduced into an apartment. People should avoid picking up used or discarded furniture, especially beds and upholstered furniture. These days, if you find something sitting out on the curb, there's a real good chance it's there for a reason, and there's a very good chance it's got bed bugs. So you want to avoid that kind of behavior. Now, same thing is true if you shop frequently in secondhand stores, like thrift shops, and a lot of people do this. Not that you shouldn't shop in thrift stores, but it's important to realize that you are at increased risk when shopping in stores that have used or secondhand items because these bed bugs can survive months without a blood meal. So if you are shopping in thrift shops, know you're at increased risk, make sure that you inspect anything that you buy before bringing it in, and you really probably want to think twice about buying furniture from these types of locations. If you're working in an apartment that has a known infestation, you just want to carry yourself with care. You don't want to sit on beds or sofas. When I'm working in an infested environment and somebody asks if I would like to sit down, I, I just say, thank you, I'm, I'm fine. You know, you're going to avoid bringing in more than you need. Bring in what you need, no additional material, and avoid staying directly in, you know, high probability bed bug areas. I work in bed bug infested environments 
all the time. I have for the last 10 years. I spend the majority of my time in infested dwellings. I've never taken a bed bug out with me. So there's really a low probability as long as you're not, like I said, sitting or resting on these types of areas. And then if for some reason you start getting itchy welts that you can't explain, you don't know where they're coming from, that doesn't mean you have bed bugs, but it means that you probably ought to do a thorough investigation to try and rule bed bugs out or determine if you do have a problem. Encasements and interceptors are great early detection tools. We already talked about interceptors a bit. Uh, let me talk about encasements. Uh, bed bug encasements, and these are encasements that are specifically designed for bed bugs. These are encasements that, they're not just the typical encasement that you go buy for $10 down at Walmart. These encasements are designed to be bed bug entry proof, bed bug escape proof, and bed bug bite proof. And by encasing a mattress and box spring before you get an infestation, not only is it going to protect the bed itself, but should bed bugs get in, if they get up onto the bed, they're not going to be able to get inside that box spring or inside that mattress where they can stay really well hidden. They're going to be restricted to the outside of this smooth white surface where you can easily detect them and easily deal with them. You'll notice this bed also has the interceptor devices on the legs or underneath the legs of the bed, and this sofa has the interceptor devices. So both of these methods work with the same concept, you know, exposing the bugs so that they can be seen readily and then dealt with. Okay, let's say we get an actual infestation. Bugs are introduced somehow, and now we're dealing with an infested dwelling. What do we do? Well, one of the first questions is, how do you deal with the beds? Most people, the knee-jerk reaction is they, they want to immediately throw them away, or they want to start dousing them in chemicals. And neither is necessary, nor is either really recommended. Instead, encasements are the most widely recommended way for dealing with infested beds. We talked about it as a proactive detection tool, but they're also a very important reactionary tool in bed bug management. So by encasing the infested beds, any bugs that are still inside the encasement will eventually starve and die. They can't get out and they can't feed through the encasement. So this is a great way of salvaging beds and not discarding them because quite frankly a lot of people can't afford to throw their beds away. But then you are going to have some people that have items that are so badly infested, whether it's a bed, a sofa, or some personal item in their home, that they can't even tolerate the thought of leaving it in their home. And they're going to throw it away no matter what. In the event that somebody decides they're going to throw it away, they really need to be contacting property management. We're re we really want to discourage them from discarding it on their own, because if they do discard it on their own, they're not going to do it correctly. Okay? And when you don't discard infested items correctly, and that means wrapping them in uh, sealed plastic tightly and you know, hopefully marking it as infested so someone else doesn't pick it up, when this isn't done, instead they're dragged out of the apartment and dragged down the hall and dragged down the elevator or the staircase. We've got bed bugs going everywhere and now it's sitting out on a curb waiting to be picked up by some unfortunate person. So proper disposal is critical. Okay, now large numbers of bed bugs can be very efficiently removed using vacuum cleaners. This is a great way if you want to quickly remove large numbers of bed bugs off of a mattress before encasing it. But vacuums have their limitations. There's a few things you really need to be concerned about. Number one, if you are vacuuming, if you are using vacuum as a, as a tool, you need to have a dedicated vacuum. In other words, that vacuum is used for bed bugs and for nothing else. Okay, otherwise we're going to have a problem with spread. You're going to need to open that vacuum as soon as you're done with it and inspect the housing, get rid of the bag, seal it, and have it discarded outside. And then the vacuum needs to go into a container until the next job. The other thing is that vacuums are not going to get all the bugs. You're not going to remove bugs from within cracks and you're not going to necessarily get the eggs because eggs are cemented firmly to the surface. So this is good for removing surface insects. Steam is another great tool and it overcomes a lot of the limitations of a vacuum cleaner because steam will actually penetrate into the cracks that a vacuum can't pull the bugs out of. Steam can penetrate through pleats and folds of fabric. So it by far is considered the most effective way for dealing with upholstered furniture. In addition, steam is effective on all stages, not just the living bugs, but also the eggs as well. So you can take a steamer and you can use that on all these upholstered f surfaces and achieve elimination that you're not gonna get with other methods. So here's a video and what you're going to see when I start the video is the, the pace that he's moving at. But I want to point out first, depending on the area, 
that you're trying to steam and how thick the pleats or the folds or the seams are, you're going to have to move it maybe a little more slowly. But you can see this is being moved at about an inch a second. And it's in complete contact with the sofa here. So you can't have it up about an inch or two. It's got to be touching the sofa and being moved at a very slow pace. And you will get lethal temperatures penetrating into the seams. Hot laundering is also another very, very effective method for dealing with bed linens and, and really anything that could be put in a washer or a dryer. So even if it can't be washed, you can put it on a hot dry cycle. The key is it's got to be a hot wash cycle or a hot dry cycle. And so this is probably one of the, the single most important things residents can do to help us to eliminate bed bugs in their environment. There's a lot of items though that can't go into a washer or dryer and there are some portable heating devices that are available for that. These are things that you can put really anything that can't be laundered but that can withstand heat into. So I, I personally use this for luggage when I come back from trips or shoes or picture frames or, or things of that nature. They plug into the wall and then depending upon the device you follow the manufacturer directions, you heat things for anywhere from four to as much as six hours and it will destroy all stages including the eggs. Okay, freezing is another option, probably more for some smaller items. But you can take items, put them in a bag, stick them in a regular household freezer and leave them there for about four days. And this also will destroy not only the bugs, but the eggs. Eliminating clutter is critical. I think you can get the idea that these bed bugs get into a lot of the contents of the structure. And the more clutter is closely associated with the sleeping or resting area, the greater the likelihood that that clutter is going to become infested. So we really want to discourage clutter from being like, you, you can't even see this person's bed and the piles of clothing all on the floor at the foot of the bed. All these types of items are, are very likely to become infested if an infestation exists in this apartment. So these are things that can be laundered and items that can't be laundered, they can be de-infested through freezing or heating and then stored in sealed bins. But it's critical that these bins are kept closed. We also want to strongly try and discourage residents from treating on their own. And this is very difficult to do because residents feel compelled to do something to help themselves. But we need to really work to educate them that many of these insecticides that they can purchase are expensive. And not only are they expensive, but they typically in general don't work real well. So they, they tend to really over apply these materials because they're not getting the results. They also can sometimes cause bed bugs to disperse from the areas that have been treated to areas where bed bugs are harder to find and to control. And finally, foggers or, or bombs, which are commonly bought over the counter, not only are they not effective on bed bugs, but they can also be quite dangerous. Dusts are another tool that residents will commonly use. A lot of residents, you know, are familiar with boric acid for cockroach control. Boric acid does not kill bed bugs. Okay, but there's another dust out there, diatomaceous earth, which people will buy, and they tend to use these inappropriately. So here, this is dust that's applied very excessively. Instead, we want to make sure that if dusts are used, that they're, they're used in a fashion that it's a light dusting that's limited closer to the baseboards and to cracks and crevices where bugs exist. Okay, so to avoid a lot of these problems, really, pesticide applications are best left to trained professionals, either an outside pest control vendor or in-house staff that is licensed with the state for the proper and legal application of chemicals. Another thing that I see as a big problem is in many cases, treatments are limited to areas where people have seen bed bugs or they believe the bed bugs exist. But bed bugs are much more mobile than people realize. So for example, this is an apartment that we had these uh, climb up interceptors throughout the entire apartment. And you can see that after 15 days, we captured 950 bugs in those interceptor devices that were scattered throughout the entire dwelling. But notice the largest number of bugs were collected out here in the hallway, not in the bedroom, not in the living room. And a lot of people wouldn't even think of treating the hallway. You'll also notice that we have a lot of bed bugs in the bathroom and we have quite a few bed bugs in the kitchen. So these are places that traditionally people would never think that bed bugs would be present. So th for these reasons, you want to make sure that you're treating entire structures, entire apartments, not just limiting it, say, to the bedroom or where someone complains of seeing bugs. Regardless of how thorough you are, 
Because of the different challenges and obstacles that I've already discussed, it's rare that you're going to eliminate a well-established infestation in just one visit. Okay, we're going to have bugs that were between blood meals, we're going to have eggs that were not detected and hatch, there's going to be clutter issues, a variety of problems, and so follow-up program is going to be absolutely necessary. Follow-ups are recommended to occur every two weeks until the problem is eliminated. Which brings up the next problem. How do you know if it's eliminated? It can be very difficult to find bed bugs in low numbers, both at the onset as well as towards the end when you're near eradication. So you want to use a multiple approach or a multi-pronged approach to determining when a problem appears to be resolved. For example, we can be doing verbal interviews with the residents, asking them whether or not they're still getting bites. But remember, not everybody reacts. We can do surveys with the residents to ask them, have they seen any bed bugs recently? Have they been bitten since we were last here? And what have they observed? In addition to that, we should be conducting visual inspections, detailed visual inspections, and using tools like encasements and interceptors to help us identify bed bugs. If all of these methods combined fail to produce any activity for six consecutive weeks, then I think it's reasonably safe to assume that the problem has been resolved. Okay, so that's how you deal with responding to an infestation. But to get real effective community-wide results, we need a proactive community-wide plan. Because typically when you're dealing with a community, if we're reacting to one infestation at a time and we're waiting for them to be reported to us, we end up just going around in circles, spending a lot of money, and every time we eliminate a problem, there's two new ones that crop up. So an effective community-wide plan is going to provide for cost-effective elimination, it's going to manage the spread of bed bugs, and it's also going to be geared towards long-term results. It starts with education of the community. That's why we're here today. We're here to educate staff first, and then we're going to start working with the residents. Okay, you can use the tools that we're providing you with today to continue this process. But everybody needs to know that bed bugs are real, that they exist what to look for, how to recognize the signs and symptoms, how to avoid bringing them in, what to do if they suspect a problem. It's also a good idea if you have a community that has a chronic bed bug infestation to conduct a baseline community-wide inspection program. The idea here is by inspecting 100% of the apartments, you're going to identify exactly how many apartments are really infested. So this is an example of a, a 360 unit apartment community. When we started with them, before we did the inspections, there were 19 infestations that the property management was aware of. These were reported by residents or identified by property management. We went through and we inspected all 360 apartments. And we did this by conducting visual inspections and placing out interceptor devices for one week. And then we went back and checked the devices. And what we found was that 43 more infestations existed in addition to the 19 that they were already aware of. So you can see that there's more than double the number of infestations than they knew about. What's more important is 85% of all of the infestations in that building had gone unreported by the residents. So you can see that if you're relying on residents to report a problem to you, you're never going to get ahead of this problem. So the recommendation would be that if a, a building is experiencing infestation rates of, say, 10% or more, that these building-wide inspections should probably occur on at least a once-a-year basis, if not twice a year. You also want to use your history to your advantage. If units had a problem in the past, then they're likely to have a problem again in the future. Either one, because the problem wasn't totally eradicated, or two, they got reintroduced in the same way they were introduced in the first place. So use the history of infested apartments to create a list of at-risk units. And these at-risk units should be placed on a periodic inspection schedule so that you're going back and you're checking up on these known past problems maybe once every three months or at least twice a year. Because if you ignore the units with past history, you're going to get burned in the long run. They will crop back up again. The other thing that I would recommend here is that not only should you inspect the units with the past history, but you should also look at the units that are neighboring those units as well, because they're also at high risk. Okay, so if we're keeping an eye on the core units, 
and we're keeping our, an eye on the units that are most likely to, to be a problem, the next thing we want to do is try and limit how many new infestations are coming into our community. And you can do this by building a new resident program. First, we can build education into their orientation. Make it part of the new resident package. You've got lots of tools that we're providing you with today. They can watch a bed bug video. They can be given a presentation or sit down and watch a video of this presentation. They can get fact sheets. So the education component should be incorporated at the beginning. Also provide them with your policy and procedure regarding bed bug management. Once they've come in, some communities are actually inspecting beds and upholstered furniture before they come into the building. Other communities don't want to be that unfriendly. But I'd say if you're not inspecting it before it comes in, once the people are moved in, certainly within no more than a month and hopefully sooner, you want to conduct a visual inspection in that apartment of at least the upholstered furniture and the sleeping and resting areas. You might also look to monitor those units with the interceptor devices or some other monitor for a couple week period once they've settled in. It is a great way to identify infestations that are coming into the community. Okay, not only do we want to identify bed bugs as they're coming into our community, but we also want to identify units before they vacate. So in other words, if you have an infestation in a unit that's about to vacate, this is one of the worst things that can happen to you. Having bed bugs in a vacant unit, if you've ever dealt with this, is a nightmare. Very difficult to deal with, very difficult to eliminate. So we want to try and avoid this at all costs. And the way you do that is once a resident communicates that they're no longer renewing their lease, is the time to get in there and to do a visual inspection and a monitoring of that unit to determine if activity is present. If you identify units at that time, you'll still have enough time before they vacate to try and eradicate that problem so you're not left with a vacant unit that's infested. When infestations are identified, either by staff or reported by a resident, make sure that you have a proper response plan when infestations are reported. So whether it's reported by management or staff or by a resident, you want to make sure that you are responding very quickly. You need to remind the residents of what their role is in the program, that they should be laundering frequently, they should be inspecting, they should be decluttering their apartments, they should be avoiding pesticides and so on. If the residents are not cooperating, if there's excessive clutter and they're not decluttering, if they're doing things that are creating an additional obstacle to control, then we're going to need management to step in. We want to make sure that you're including surrounding units in the scope of service. Don't just focus on the infested unit. Also get into the surrounding units and continue inspecting those surrounding units at least once per month until the primary unit where the problem existed has been eliminated. And if it's in the budget, you might also want to consider getting encasements into those surrounding units as well, encasing the mattresses and box springs of those units um, because again there's a high probability that bed bugs can move into these adjacent units. Finally you want to make sure that your treatment uh, program is designed for long-term success, that it's not just designed to reduce populations but to see it through to eradication. So I use this as my last slide because really bed bug management is like a three-legged stool, okay? It requires in order to get elimination, it requires a cooperative effort by both property management, by the residents, as well as the pest control vendor or the pest control staff that's in-house. And if any one of these legs is not equally supporting the top, it's going to tumble over. And so that's what bed bug management's about. It's a team effort. We really need everybody to be involved. So we have to have residents that know their role and cooperate. We need property management that is backing and supporting the program and willing to step in when they need to. And we need a vendor or pest control operator who is qualified to eradicate the infestation. With that, I'm going to conclude. If there's additional information available to you at the EPA website that's listed here, if you have questions, Chang Lu Wong, Dr. Wong's email is listed as well. And I also want to acknowledge the United States EPA for funding this presentation as well as the rest of this project. Thank you very much.